to your name, Father. Yeah. 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 Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Well, better say that. Come on. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Come on, somebody. Leave that up there for a minute. I want that, uh, that, that little picture there that you see of the living waters. Who is calling me? You believe that? <laughs> I always put this on my desk. Obama wants to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> Turn that off and put it in my, in my office. But it's probably my friend Steve Pascal. He's not, he's not beyond doing something like that. <laughs> Knowing that I'm getting ready to preach, he's going to call me on the phone. He's the same guy. We were in seminary classes together. And he took my cell phone that was sitting on the table and placed it inside my briefcase. I had a Samsonite that had the combination code. He put my, he put my cell phone in my briefcase. He closed it and he rolled it so the combination was shifted. Then he got his phone out and he called me right in the middle of class. And it's going off like that. And uh, I'm trying to get to it. And there, the professor just stopped. And he's going, please let me know when I can continue. So it's probably him. And I'll deal with him later. Thank you, brother. You let me know if that cell phone gives you enough trouble. On the front of your bulletin, and I want him to leave this little graphic up here. It says, those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of living water gushing up to eternal life. <coughs> you know, people search for happiness in this world in lots of different places. Now they're calling the church phone. Somebody is, is seriously trying to get a hold of us. <laughs> Our thirst for happiness is unquenchable in and by this world. Let me say that again. Our thirst for happiness is unquenchable in and by this world. If we do not have the wisdom to seek it from God or to seek it in God, then we will find whatever substitutes the world has to offer. <clears throat> Terrorists find their happiness in blowing up things. Executives may find it in climbing the corporate ladder. Athletes find it in breaking world records. Scholars find it in publishing books. Gamblers may find it in Las Vegas or Reno. Musicians may find it by getting on during MTV awards and doing their strutting their stuff. That's happened this week. The sources where people, I'm going to come back to that, by the way. The sources where people seek happiness apart from God are countless. We could list them. Alcohol, drugs, sex, bodybuilding, television, movies, video games, eating, talking, walking, and the list could go on and on and on and on and on. But the happiness that these things bring is not true and lasting happiness. The happiness that these things bring is not ultimate and eternal. The things that these things bring is not the joy for which you and I were made. <clears throat> and therefore it leaves us unsatisfied and frustrated and incomplete, knowing that there must be something more. But that ultimate and eternal happiness that we all crave, that we all have a, a space inside of our very being that needs to be filled, and we try to fill it with all of this stuff, can only be found believe it or not, by getting wisdom. <clears throat> the title of my sermon today is Get Wisdom. I started to say God Wisdom and show a picture of somebody with the milk, but I couldn't figure out what the milk 
you know, you know what I'm saying, got milk, you know, I couldn't figure it out. So we'll just go with this. <laughs> happiness, eternal happiness can only be found by getting wisdom. Therefore, I think it's supremely important that we get wisdom. <clears throat> now, you may be asking yourself, Pastor, what are you talking about? Pastor Vance, what am I going to say next? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the wisdom that I'm referring to is not the wisdom of this world. I will tell you this right now. <clears throat> that wisdom is quickly dismissed by the writer of Proverbs. Yeah. Amen. Say that. Say Proverbs 1, 20 to 33 says this. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refused to listen. Let me say that again. I have called and you refused to listen. Have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded it. Because you have ignored all of my counsel and would have none of my reproof, Look at this. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. I want to put this in context before we go on. People today, people today have said that we live in a post-Christian nation. What I mean by that and what people mean by that when they say that is that we have abandoned the principles upon which this very nation were founded. We have unhooked our boats from the dock of our spiritual foundations and we are now floating on a sea of whatever seems right to you, then you do it. And, and, and God says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. Keep going. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me. Listen, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their ways and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. You see, the wisdom of this world, the wisdom that this world has to offer you and to me is not the wisdom that comes from, from advanced degrees or years of formal education. The, the, the wisdom that we need, the wisdom that we need in our life today doesn't come because we have gone to a, a, an institute of higher learning. In fact, many of our institutes of higher learning in our nation today are turning people's hearts away from God right. and not towards God. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's right. The wisdom of God is what we need. And you, can't, you cannot necessarily get that in formal education. True story. But it is so important. It, it was so important that Solomon wanted his sons to have it. And he writes this. Is, I'm sorry, we're going to... You need to fasten your spiritual seatbelts because we're going to read a lot of scripture today. We're going to read a lot. Proverbs 4, 1 through 13. This is Solomon speaking to his sons. He says, Hear, O sons of, father, hear, o sons of father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. And then he goes back. He reminisces a little bit. He said, When I was a son with my father, 
tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. There it is. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her. We're talking about wisdom here. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. Now that's the second time that he said get wisdom and get insight. I want you to notice that. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Proverbs 9.10 tells us this. The fear of the Lord. I want you to underline this if you you don't mind writing in your Bible, underline this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. There it is again, knowledge and insight. The wisdom that leads to the ultimate joy that we're seeking, that happiness that we're seeking, and the, end, the wisdom that leads to life begins with knowing and fearing God. Now, Fearing the Lord doesn't mean that we shake in our boots and we don't want to, we don't want to approach Him because he's, he's too holy and we cannot approach Him in that sense. No, it isn't that kind of fear. It is a fear, though, that fears running away from Him. In other words, you're afraid to run away from Him because if you're away from Him, you cannot receive from Him. It is a fear. It means fearing to seek refuge and joy and hope anywhere other than in God. We don't find our, our hope and our refuge anywhere else but in God. It's a fear of trying to find it anywhere else. It's a fear that, that's keeping before our eyes what a fearful prospect it is to stop trusting and depending upon God to meet our needs. The fear of the Lord is, is in the, since, since that's the case, then the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not only in the sense that it's the first step in a wise way to live, but also in the sense that all the later characteristics of wisdom flow from the fear of the Lord like a river flows from a spring. So let's look at some examples here. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes... Then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. You see, the wise person is characterized by humility. The person who is proud does not fear the Lord. <clears throat> the person who is proud cannot get to first base in wisdom because they have a haughty spirit. But the person who fears the Lord is humble because he realizes that his dependence is upon God for everything in his life. And he fears to take credit for the things that he may have done when in fact it was God who did it. I'm reminded of a story by Jerry Clower, who's a country comedian, has gone on to be with the Lord now. But, uh, he said that he used to write down all the things that he did for God inside of his inside the inside cover of his Bible. And he, he had quite a list, and then one day he tore it out of his Bible, kind of messing up the inside front cover of his Bible. His wife said, what in the world are you doing? He said, I'm afraid that I, I needed to get rid of that because if I'd have gotten to heaven, that God's list of the things that I've done may not have been as long as mine. <laughs> the thing is, is humility, unlike pride, does not shriek, does not, does not pull away, does not back off. When, we're, when they're commanded to do something. And, and this is essential for the advancement of wisdom because Moses taught us that wisdom consisted in knowing and doing the commandments of God. Say that. Knowing and doing the commandments of God. And that doing piece is important 
It isn't just hearing it and saying, got it, filed away, information. No, it's, it's hearing it and causing us from, from our mind to our feet, causing us to move and to do something. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 6 says this, Behold, I have taught you statutes and ordinances, as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them. Keep going. Keep them and do them, for they will be your wisdom, your understanding. Go ahead to the next one. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Jesus said the same thing about this in his own words. Matthew 7, 24, he said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Okay? Now, there's a whole parable there, and you need to go back and read that parable when you get a chance. But you don't build a house upon the sand. I have a story about that. It's a war story. When we were in, when we were in Desert Storm, we moved from King Fight Airport in the parking garage where we lived. Joe Bradley was in that parking garage with me. Can I get a witness? Amen. And we moved out into the desert. Now, there was an advance party that went out into the desert. And that advance party got there before the rest of us got there. And they set up all of their tents in smooth places where it was easy to pound tent pegs into the ground. When I got there, they said, Chaplain, you go over there and set your tent up right there. And they pointed to a pile of rocks. And I said, are you kidding me? And they said, no, you need to go there. And I said, yes, sir. I saluted, and we went there, my chaplain assistant and I. We literally could not pound stakes. We'd pound stakes in, and they would bend because it would hit rock. And so finally what we had to do was we had to, we had to fashion a contraption where we'd take boulders, and we would wrap the tent ropes around it, and we would set those out, and then we would stack other rocks on top of them in order to keep the tent up. And it, and it was hard work. And then, and then the rains came. And all of those tents, all of those tents that were set up in the smooth sand where there were no rocks, there's another name for that smooth sand it's called wadi. You know what a wadi is? Down where I come from, it's called a creek. When it rains in the rainy season, that's where the water flows. And these tents that were set up in the smooth sand were not in the sand. They were under water. The water was about that high inside their tents. And I got up the next morning after this terrible rainstorm, and I step out of my tent, and I do one of these because I'm on a little rock island. <laughs> my tent was pitched on a rock, and it was a little harder to do that, but I tell you what, I was on a little island. And I just stayed in my tent that day and let the other people deal with their water and wringing out their wet stuff. And, and you know what? I had a lot of people that came to visit me because <laughs> I had coffee on and they didn't have coffee because their coffee was underwater. <laughs> it only rained two days a year. Who knew? <laughs> Wives built his house upon a rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. A good definition of godly wisdom is simply this. Hearing and doing God's word. That's it. Hearing and doing God's word. God's work, you see, is a divine prescription for how to finally be cured of all unhappiness. Wisdom is the practical knowledge of how to gain this happiness. <clears throat> Therefore, wisdom is hearing and doing the Word of God. But the only people who will do this are the people who are humbly relying on God for help and who fear to seek happiness anywhere else but in Him. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is the beginning and the spring of all true wisdom. But something, has, has, something more has to be said about the nature of this wisdom. It's not enough to say it is a humble hearing and doing of God's Word because, um, because sometimes God's Word does not speak to the exact issues that we have to deal with. Sometimes we have to ask God to give us wisdom. 
Solomon, a story about Solomon is a good example of this, and it'll illustrate this. I'm going to, sorry, it's a little lengthy, but I'm going to read it to you. 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28. One day, two prostitutes came to King Solomon, okay, and stood before him. The one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. And when we were alone, there was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house. Keep going. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living child is mine and the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours and the living child is mine. Thus, they spoke before the king. <clears throat> then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. The other says, no, but your son is dead and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. And the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first one. By no means put him to death. She is his mother. Amen. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered. And they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Do you understand that no biblical command told Solomon what to do? There was no verse in the Bible that told him what to do when these two women came with this problem. But that Solomon got the wisdom from God. God gave him the wisdom. He, wisdom must include then sensitivity, mature judgment or discernment of how the fear of the Lord should work itself out in all the ways that are not specifically dealt with in the Bible. That's why he said in these passages, seek wisdom and insight. Seek wisdom and insight. Another word for insight is discernment. It's not enough to seek wisdom. We can gain happiness when we have wisdom, but we also need insight. It took insight for Solomon to make that decision, to come up with that plan on how to find the real mother in that story. This has to be what Paul calls in Romans 12 too, a renewing of the mind, which is then able to examine and approve the will of God. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and, keep going, acceptable and perfect. You see, that discernment comes from knowing God's will, but knowing God's word and then seeking God's discernment in each and every situation. It's absolutely necessary. He calls the spiritual wisdom in Colossians 1.9. He says, we have not ceased to pray for you that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Of course, the wisdom which follows God's word and the wisdom which discerns the way to act when there's no clear word from God are not separate. It is precisely by filling our minds and our hearts with the word of God. Then we gain the spiritual wisdom to guide us in each and every situation. So, <clears throat> today I want to give you five keys to getting wisdom. Sorry, it took us a long time to get to this point. But I think these, this is that I needed to set the stage for that if we're going to be able to get to these five. So these are the five. Number one, desire wisdom with all your might. Desire wisdom with all your might. How important is wisdom to you? If you were to prioritize the things you want in life, where would wisdom appear on that list? Or would it appear at all? 
I mean, honestly. The truth is, is that if we were to list all the things we wanted in life, most of us would start listing possessions of some kind. You know, when I was in the Army, you used to say, what can I do for you? People would, uh, when I was in personnel administration, people would come in and I'd say, what can I do for you? They'd say, give me a million dollars in a 30-day pass. You know, okay, I guess I've dated myself. Nobody, nobody even. You know, we, you know, God, if you, if you could have anything you wanted from God, what would it be? Wisdom needs to be at the top of that list. Wisdom and discernment. Wisdom and insight. Chances are wisdom wouldn't even make the top 50 in some people's lists because they don't desire it at all. And those people feel like they have arrived, and that's a very dangerous place to be in. When you feel like you've arrived, that God can't give you anything else. <laughs> Please don't hang out with me, because I don't want the lightning to strike and accidentally hit me. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 8 says, prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. Proverbs 2, 4 says, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. We need to desire wisdom with all our might. It needs to be at the top of our list. Not just our spiritual list. It needs to be at the top of all of our list. This is exactly what Solomon asked from God. God said, I will give you anything. What do you want? And he said, give me wisdom. We're going to come back to that. Since wisdom is found in the word of God, then number two, we must apply ourselves to study and meditate on the word to know and do it. Psalm 19.7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. <clears throat> How much time do you spend reading and studying the Word of God? Well, well Pastor, you, you don't understand my life. You don't understand. I just don't have any time. Really? Really? You don't have any time. How many hours did you spend watching television this week? Amen. Amen. How many times did you spend, how much time did you spend on your cell phone doing stuff? I don't mean talking on it. I mean all the other stuff you can do on your cell phone. Somebody said Facebook. Facebook always comes up when we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you can be on your phone if you're reading God's word on it. That's right. But most of us aren't. Most of us are doing Snapchat. Now, if you don't know what that is, ask your neighbor. They probably know what it is. Instagram. There you go. There's another one. Another waste time waster. Candy Crush. Candy Crush. Oh my goodness. I don't know how many times people invite me to come and play Candy Crush. Folks, I will not, I will not play one game on Facebook. Quit inviting me. Amen. I will not play any games on Facebook. Quit inviting me. I have so many invites in my thing, I have to go in and delete them about twice a week. Yes. Quit inviting me. I'm not going to do it. Amen. Let me give you this, though. Suppose you can read, and some of you can read more, some of you can read less, but let's, for the sake of argument, suppose... You read about 250 words a minute. Some of you can do that. And you resolve to devote 15 minutes a day to serious reading of God's Word and studying God's Word to deepen your grasp of biblical truth. In one year, that's 365 days, you would read for 5,475 minutes. Now, if you multiply that times 250 words per minute, you get 1 million. 368,750 words per year. Now, most books have between 300 and 400 words per page. So we take 350 words per page and divide that into 1,368, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000, 1,368,000
368,750 words per year, we get 3,910 pages per year. That means at 250 words a minute, 15 minutes a day, you could read the average of 20 books in one year, or you could read your Bible five or six times. And yet most of us don't read through the Bible once in a year. If wisdom is found in the Word of God, then we need to apply ourselves. We need to study and meditate on the Word to know and to do it. Number three, we need to pray for wisdom. This is what Solomon did in King, 1 Kings 3.9. It says, God said to him, or, or Solomon says, Give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? And look at what God did for him in verses 10 through 12. It said, It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to, them, said to him, Because you have asked this, and not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. Solomon prayed for wisdom, and God granted that request. Daniel understood his need for this in Daniel 2, 27 to 30. You see, Daniel <coughs> had been called in because the king had had, had had a dream, and he was very disturbed by this, and he needed someone to interpret the dream. And so Daniel was called in, and Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To, you, uh, to make known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You see, he said, it isn't wisdom that I have, but he got that from God. It's wisdom that was granted to him by God for a specific circumstances. And Paul prayed that, it, that God would give it to the church, the Colossian church. In Colossians 1.9, he says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. And listen to what he prayed. He said, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And to the church in Ephesus, he prayed in Ephesus 1.17, Ephesians 1.17, he said that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And James tells us how to get it in James 1.5. This was our VBS verse a couple of years ago. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. If you want wisdom, then you need to pray for wisdom. This next one is interesting. We talked a little bit about this in, in our Sunday school class, in our Bible study class this morning. But this next point is also very interesting. Think frequently about your death. What in the world? has that got to do with seeking wisdom? What has that got to do with seeking wisdom? To think frequently about your death or think of the shortness of this life and the infinite length of the next. Psalm 90 and verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. What this means is that we need to be redeeming the time. We talked a few minutes ago about time wasters. In our Bible study class this morning, we discussed the fact that none of us knows how long we have left to live. Some of you may walk out of here today, God forbid, but that some of you may walk out of here today and get out on, on 41A or get out on the interstate or somewhere else in town and get T-boned by a car. And the next thought that you have is you're standing before God. And your time on this earth is over. But if you think about how short your time on this earth is compared to eternity, 
then you realize that you must be spending this time doing things that have eternal significance. That because most of the things, that, come on, let's be honest. Most of the things that we do today, most of the things that we do each day of our lives has to do with temporal things, has to do with things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Honestly, don't we? That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, take no thought of what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Don't fret about those things. Listen, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Get your priorities straight. Get your priorities straight. If you're focusing on what you're going to do five years or ten years or fifteen, now listen, don't go away from here saying, the pastor said we don't need to plan for the future. Okay? You need to plan for the future. You need to plan as if you're going to live forever. And you need to be prepared for eternity as if you're going to die today. Because we don't know how long we've got left on this earth. That's right. So we need to redeem the time. So we need to be about the Father's business. Amen. Amen. We need to be busy doing the things that have eternal significance. Yes. And it says here in Psalm 90, 12, teach us to number our days so we can get a heart of wisdom. In other words, if we don't know how long we've got, then we need to spend the time that we do know, which is now, Getting wisdom. Think frequently about your death. And number five, <clears throat> we need to come to Jesus. Now, sometimes we use the term come to Jesus with the word meeting after it. <laughs> need to have a come to Jesus meeting. That's a whole different thing, okay? If you don't know what that is, see me afterwards and I'll tell you about a come to Jesus meeting. Amen. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about here. We need to come to Jesus. Why is it that we need to come to Jesus? We need to come to Jesus because, you see, Solomon spoke God's wisdom, but Jesus is the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30 says, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the, here it is, wisdom of God, and because of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Solomon spoke God's wisdom. Jesus is the wisdom of God. So we need to come to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus because others have spoken the truth, but Jesus is the truth. Others have pointed to the way of life, but Jesus is both the way and the life. John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Others had given promises, but all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Others had given promises, but all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Others had offered God's forgiveness, but Jesus bought it with His death. Therefore, in Jesus, as Colossians 2, 3 says, it, it is in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid. So therefore, the command, get wisdom, means first and foremost, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. If you want wisdom in your life, then you need to be spending time with Jesus because that's where you're going to find wisdom. If you want to learn how to live a wise and discerning life, then you need to follow Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. Amen. Get wisdom means come to Jesus in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom. So, as we summarize, as we come to the conclusion of this, in the Bible, when it says get wisdom, it's referring to that practical knowledge of how to attain true and, and happy and, and lasting happiness. I talked about <laughs> Miley Cyrus, a little bit earlier. If you don't know what happened this week, you need to go on. No, don't stay your eyes. You don't need to watch the video. You don't need to watch the video. I've been praying to God to get that vision out of my mind. Let me know if it works for you. It's not working for me. But you need to know about Miley Cyrus. 
Miley Cyrus was raised in the church. Miley Cyrus professed Christ as her Lord and Savior. Yes, yes, she did. But somewhere along the way, she chose to seek the world's wisdom instead of the wisdom from God. And what happened this week is a prime example of what happens when you seek man's approval instead of God's approval. When you seek the wisdom of this world instead of the wisdom from God, then you can get out on the stage and do silly, foolish stuff like she did. She, got, she made a lot of money doing it, I have no doubt. Not one penny of that can she take with her into eternity. And, and what, a, what a sad witness she has been to all of those fans of hers that have known her since she was <coughs> Hannah Montana right. on Disney yeah. and who grew up with her and who still see her as a role model. Yes. What damage has she done to the kingdom of God yes. by her negative example? Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, and it consists in humbly hearing and doing God's will That's that we get from both in Scripture and the unique circumstances of the moment as God's Spirit gives you the right words to say or the right things to do to make the right choices that are going to bring honor and glory to Him. Such wisdom is essential because the person who has it finds life and joy, but the person who doesn't find it finds death and misery. Therefore, I challenge you today with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my being, get wisdom. Get wisdom. Get wisdom. Let's go. With one love.